some of the good people of both races who live under the protection of the United States may not be satisfied with the decision of the Supreme Court. The law is there to uphold the human principle, that there is equal justice because we feel it in our hearts, that this is the law of our hearts. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if in short he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content? What is on TV? What is on TV? What the world has seen it? We will march in Washington on August 28th, 1963, along with hundreds of thousands of our fellow Americans. All men are created equal. I'm Bernadette Peel, an assistant county attorney, and I'm also a member of the Prince William County Black History Committee. Each February, since the early 90s, Prince William County government has celebrated Black History Month by hosting activities and events to educate and celebrate the many contributions African Americans have made in all walks of life. Each year the county adopts the national theme of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. The 2009 theme is the quest for black citizenship in the Americas. One cannot follow the quest for black citizenship in America without the path taking us back to the creation of an organization of people who believed that all men and women are created equal. This organization is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Born from the horrors of racial discrimination during the time when segregation ruled the day and lynchings were rampant, was an organization with the goal of righting the societal and governmental wrongs of the systematic racism that prevailed. In January of 1909, Dr. Henry Markowitz, a social worker for immigrants living in New York, Mrs. Mary White Overton, a social worker and descendant of abolitionists, William English Walling, a wealthy southerner and a writer, George Edward Russell, a friend of Walling, and Oswell Garrison Villard, publisher of the New York Evening Post, met to pool their ideas of starting a national organization of interracial participants to address the social injustices of the country. In a historical account of the origin of the NAACP, Mrs. Overton wrote, in the summer of 1908, the country was shocked by the account of race riots at Springfield, Illinois. Here in the home of Abraham Lincoln, a mob containing many of the town's best citizens raged for two days, killed and wounded scores of Negroes, and drove thousands from the city. The magnitude of these riots brought to the forefront the need for organized opposition to these injustices, so the group decided it would hold a public meeting to invite others to join the cause. Organized on February 12, 1909, on the centennial birth of Abraham Lincoln, this organization was originally called the National Negro Committee. But within two years of its inception, the organization was incorporated as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The founders included, among others, William Edward Birdhart Du Bois, Ida Wells Bennett, Mary Church Terrell, James Weldon Johnson, and W.L. Berkeley. They believed that through nonviolent protests and legal actions, equal rights would be achieved for all Americans. The NAACP's first significant involvement in a legal action was in 1910 in the case of Pink Franklin, an illiterate farmhand who shot and killed a police officer after the officer broke into his home in the pre-dawn hours of the morning to serve Franklin with a civil warrant under a South Carolina statute already deemed to be unconstitutional by the state court. Mr. Franklin was tried for murder and found to be guilty by the South Carolina State Court. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld a decision of the State Court, 
but the NAACP was influential in getting the South Carolina governor to commute the sentence from the death penalty to life in prison. This case led to the creation of a legal redress department of the NAACP. In that same year, the first issue of the NAACP's publication, The Crisis, began circulation. W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the NAACP's Director of Publicity and Research, was also the editor of the paper. The Crisis is one of the oldest black publications in America and is still in circulation today. By 1913, African Americans who were able to secure jobs in the federal government found themselves working in segregated offices, using separate restrooms, and eating in separate lunchrooms. In response to the Jim Crow policies, the NAACP launched a campaign against segregation in the federal government with several letters to President Woodrow Wilson protesting segregation in federal agencies. By 1919, the lynching of African Americans had become so brazen they were advertised in newspapers before the event. To put the nation on notice of these horrific acts of blatant indignities, in 1922, the NAACP started placing large ads in major newspapers about the facts behind the lynchings and started lobbying for federal anti-lynching laws. With more than 3,000 branches of the NAACP now in existence and a membership of approximately 90,000, the push was on to stop civil injustices and demand equal rights for all American citizens. By the 1930s, the NAACP had formed long-term strategies for focusing on the legal process and challenging segregation in the schools and universities. In 1930, Walter Francis White, an African American with white skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair, and a member of the NAACP since 1918, engineered and led the successful strategy that prevented Judge John J. Parker a federal court of appeals judge for the Fourth Circuit from being seated as a United States Supreme Court judge based on his support for denying the vote to African Americans and his anti-labor rulings. That same year, Walter White recruited Charles Hamilton Houston, a Howard Law School dean, to serve as the chief legal counsel for the NAACP. Houston's strategies in challenging the school segregation would pave the way for his protege, Thurgood Marshall, to prevail in the Brown versus Board of Education decision that overturned the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson decision. In the Plessy decision, the U.S. Supreme Court justices determined that a Louisiana law mandating separate but equal accommodations for African Americans was constitutional. In 1936, Thurgood Marshall, a Howard Law School graduate, joined the NAACP as an assistant special counsel to Mr. Houston. Houston's plan was to challenge segregation by insisting that the Plessy ruling of separate but equal accommodations in the school system be enforced. To achieve equal accommodations, states would either have to build new schools, which most couldn't afford to do, or admit African Americans into the white schools. With the right cases, it would be undeniable that inequalities existed in educational opportunities. In the words of Mr. Houston, the NAACP will never compromise with segregation. It is not a question of wanting to sit in class with white students. It is a question of vindicating one's citizenship. Taking on the case of Lord Gaines, an African-American student trying to get admission to the University of Missouri Law School, the NAACP was successful in getting a ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court that the law school could not exclude a student because of his race and that when states offer secondary education, they must provide equal in-state educational facilities for all people, either by admitting them into the secondary school or creating one since there were no black law schools in Missouri. This case was significant because it marked the beginning of the U.S. Supreme Court's review of the separate but equal ruling and the erosion of the Plessy ruling. In 1939, the